Hey, this is Jason Bake from Compounding Capital Group. If you want to learn how to use your small acts to build a lasting empire, you should be listening to the Small Acts Podcast with my good friend, Nico. Hey guys, it's your boy Nico here from the Small Axe Podcast. I want to show you how to use your small axe to build a lasting empire. You see, not everybody begins their investing career with millions of dollars, a huge network of investors, or the knowledge necessary to become successful in this space. And that's okay. What I focus on here on this podcast is helping you hone your skills, sharpen your tools to become the best investor that you can be. Now, I want you to sit back, relax, and enjoy this show. If you have any questions or you want to reach out to me or the guest, feel free to do so. Love you guys. Okay, Small Axe community, welcome back to another awesome episode of this show. I got Jason Bake on with me, and I'm really excited for you guys to listen to his story. He is a great dude, and he's got some really cool things cooking or baking. Welcome, Jason. Thanks for having me, Nico. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to talk to you now. I kind of went high level on your bio. Maybe you can share a little bit more of how you got to where you are today. Uh, yeah, sure. So I used to work in corporate America uh, as, a, as a data scientist. I uh, gave that career up about two years ago uh, when I had absolutely no real estate experience, hadn't even owned my own house, had zero units, but uh, I always knew that I wanted to eventually go into the real estate world and try to be an entrepreneur. So I decided to, to take a chance on myself for the first time in my life. Um, since then, uh, yeah, have some uh, multifamily deals out of Cincinnati and Ohio, uh, out of Alabama, and I'm an active full-time real estate investor, uh, mostly focusing on underwriting, asset management, anything that deals with, you know, keeping like the back of the house together. Man, that's amazing. So you're full time. Uh yeah, yeah. Full time for, for about two years. Uh been uh quite a journey. I don't necessarily recommend anyone taking a huge leap of faith like I did, but uh I, I just know how I function best and I figured I, I had to take a chance of myself. Yeah. Are you based in are you in New Jersey? Uh yeah, yeah. Uh grew up in New Jersey, went to school in Chicago, realized I had no friends or family there, so I, I had to move back to the East Coast. Gotcha. Yeah. And, and you mentioned a few different markets that you like investing in. And, but before we get there, you mentioned also that you, you know, you were you dabbling in real estate prior. What were you doing prior to multifamily? Uh, I started off actually in single family homes. I bought a few single families in Philadelphia, realized that it was a little too slow to scale. And I didn't really like the concept of just consistently borrowing. So I decided to go into larger multifamily because it's more Functions more of as like a professional business uh, and haven't looked back since. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. You know, and there, I, we obviously, most um, guests that I have on this show, I ask that question to, mm -hmm. and it's always a little different, you know, answer. And I really like the fact that you pointed out that it does commercial real estate functions as a business. And that is a key difference that people tend to forget. A lot of people say, you know, scalability, I couldn't scale mm -hmm. fast enough, but it does. You, you can function. It will function as a business. I love it. Um, yeah, yeah. All right. So when was like your first multifamily acquisition? Uh, my first one was actually a, uh, a lead syndication deal that we took on with uh, when I say we, I mean, me and my business partner, Jay Balakar. And so that was a 36 unit that I, I took on in 20, was it 2021? Maybe it was either late 2021 or early 2022. And, uh, yeah, it was out of uh, Cincinnati. Uh, sorry, it was out of yeah the Cincinnati region. Uh, our first five hundred six B syndication, and so I, I essentially jumped from owning single family homes to being a, a lead uh, syndicator as my as my second deal. So it's it quite a learning curve, but uh, I mean the the assets performing well, and we're kind of looking forward for bigger projects too. Man, okay, so this is funny. I'm having Jay. So today is December fifth. I don't know when mm -hmm. this is going to air. Maybe it actually might air the 14th ish or so i'm not 100 okay. sure, but really interesting i am uh i'm going to be interviewing jay in a couple oh, very days cool. so, yeah. very very cool he's the man i love you guys so uh I, tell me a little bit about the general the uh, your partnership on the gp team are you guys the only ones on the team are there others are there kps who do you have on that team 
Uh, yeah, so uh, Jay and I are in a number of deals together, and we come in as sort of like a team as compounding capital group. Uh, but we obviously can't take down multifamily assets, just the two of us. So we have uh, KPs, we have uh, just like other partners, other people from MIH. Uh, Yosef's actually on one of our deals. So um, we definitely do have other GP partners, but Jay and I are kind of like, I guess, a package because we're trying to grow a brand together. Okay. I'm, I'm personally curious about that too, because I work with two guys very closely and we're mm -hmm. considering, you know, kind of jo joining forces together to go to, you know, do our deals together moving forward. So tell mm -hmm. me a little bit about how you guys structured it. Is it an LLC? Um, how did you come up with it and how does it work? Uh, so the brand exists separately because compounding capital doesn't technically own any of the multifamily. Every time we uh, buy a new property, we create a new LLC anyway. And so we just come in as separate individuals or separate LLCs. Uh, but everything on the branding front, we do together. So uh, the website we created together, that's uh, about to launch in uh, ideally a few weeks. Uh, and then when we talk to investors, compounding capital logo and, and things like that. So uh, there's, nothing, there's no deal where Jay and I come in as a single entity. Uh, we're just, we're separated because it's a new LLC anyway. But uh, yeah, just for branding purposes. Perfect. Makes sense. Thank you. All right, cool. And um, all right, so that was a 36 unit in Cincinnati, you said? Uh, yeah. And then we've also taken down uh, like a 17 unit and a 24 unit this year, um, co-sponsored a larger like 250 unit deal. Uh, we just kind of help with asset management, raise capital for it. So um, was our first foray into being co-sponsors, but we're probably going to try to stick to being just lead sponsors ourselves because we are operators first and foremost. Uh, I can attest to that. Yes, 100%. Some you guys are, you, that's what you guys do. You guys are, you get in, involved, you know, hands on, very, very, mm. you know, focused on asset management, very focused on making sure the, the building's performing the way it's supposed to be. I, I can see you guys down the road, you know, doing, taking management in house as well. So really business oriented. Uh, and then I talk to people who are solely focused on raising capital that don't mm. want anything to do with the management, the day-to-day, -day, the asset management. They just want to bring capital, get uh, yeah. some share of the GP and then move on. So I, I definitely see that. So, uh, okay. So you said a 24 and like a 17 or something like mm. that. Where, where yeah. were those? Uh, still in Cincinnati uh, because so Jay lives in Cincinnati uh, and that's sort of the market that we've been taking a look at. Uh, for a few years. So it's an area that we specialize in. It's not necessarily the most booming of markets. I know a lot of people, you know, invest in Dallas, Texas, or North Carolina or Florida. Uh, Cincinnati is still solid, but uh, we like it just because we have a competitive advantage. Um, it's really important, especially for people starting out. It's easy for us to, for new investors to get really wrapped up in the hot markets, the ones yeah. that you mentioned. And I made that mistake and it took me three years because oh, wow. of the, how competitive it was to actually close on a deal right. in that extremely competitive market. So I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it for those uh, beginners, but you know, down the road, yeah, maybe you can dabble in the tougher, more competitive markets, but it doesn't mean you know, Cincinnati is a bad market. Actually, you guys have found a lot of success. So maybe you could talk a little bit about how your deals are going. Uh, yeah, yeah. Actually, before that, though, it's funny that you mentioned the the topic about the hot markets, because every time, you know, like some newer investors will always reach out to me. And one of their first questions is, what market should I invest in? Like, I everyone tells me that Raleigh is great. Everyone tells me that, you know, Phoenix is great. Um, and my advice to them is the same thing that you just said, where like to start off with, it really doesn't make sense to try to compete with every other investor in the world uh, in, in Austin, right? Because there's, there's just so much competition. It It's really hard to kind of get your foot in the door. Um, so, I mean, we still like Cincinnati. We're going to stay there for a while. Um, hopefully we'll, we'll expand our portfolio by, you know, leveraging key partnerships. Uh, but yeah, I, I kind of I have the same philosophy. Any newer investors who... Uh, reach out to me. I always say, just try to find a competitive advantage anywhere. Maybe it's your, just your back home or your backyard, or it's an area that you grew up in that you just know very well. So yeah, I know. I, I love that advice too. Um, yeah. I mean, even just, even just for underwriting purposes, so you don't spoil any relationships with deals, just take a look at some with brokers, rather take a look at some deals in a variety of markets that you're probably not going to even invest in, get your, your hands dirty and, and just kind of start learning. Right, right. No, I, I love that. Um, 
in terms of how our deals are going, uh, they're they're going pretty well. So we, uh, when debt was exploding about six months ago, Jay and I made a very conscious effort to take on just fixed rate debt. So we wanted to be as safe as possible. Obviously, uh, the projected returns were a little lower, uh, but we wanted to kind of hedge against any thing that's going to happen in the market. So we have um, still a number of years before any changes to our, uh, you know, our mortgage payments happen. Um, we're making great progress on construction. We are trying to keep costs as low as possible and it helps that Jay is, is amazing at construction management. We have uh, two crews that actively work for us on most of our projects. And so we're able to keep our rehab pretty competitive in terms of just keeping costs low, but keeping quality high. Um, and I think everyone right now in the real estate world, specifically multifamily is suffering from leasing issues. Uh, it's, you know, winter months, but also there's a lot of uncertainty with high inflation and a lot of, you know, unemployment. So uh, that's something that, you know, everyone is going through, but, and we're not immune to it either. But uh, aside from, market conditions our, our properties are going pretty well we're, we're on track uh we're looking to hopefully instead of like we were hoping to refi we hadn't promised any of our passive investors or our partners a refi but um, hopefully within the next six months we'll be able to take out you know supplemental loans and try to give people a little bit of cash back that way awesome man i love it uh, what do you like about Cincinnati? Cincinnati. I have I've looked a little bit in Cleveland. I owned something mm -hmm. in Columbus for a while, but I've never really looked in Cincinnati. Maybe you can give kind of uh, just a few uh, details of maybe the vintage or what the, the buildings are like. Some things to watch out for for investors considering pursuing something in Cincinnati. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, Cincinnati has a, a great uh, deal of inventory that is sort of in that mid range. There's not really a lot of 100 plus unit apartment complexes, but there's a ton of 10 to let's say 60 unit deals. So there's never a shortage of them for us to take a look at. Uh, in comparison, like I've I've invested in uh, Philadelphia. I've taken a look at places like Lehigh Valley in Pennsylvania, and in Lehigh Valley, for example, like you'll never find anything above an aplex. It's like really really rare. So uh, in Cincinnati, it allows us, it gives us the option to scale because there's both like a lot of quadplexes and also a lot of 80 units. So I like the inventory there. Um, and uh, population growth is flat, but the, yeah, I mean, it's a major metro. It's got 2 million people. Uh, Dayton is pretty close by about 45 minutes north. And Columbus is also maybe an hour away. So it's, that's actually the triangle that we try to focus on, Dayton, Cincinnati, and Columbus. And Columbus is absolutely booming. It's like, you know, a lot of people say it's like the next Austin, a lot of tech jobs moving there. Very competitive, but a great place. Uh, Dayton isn't as uh, booming. We try not to be in Dayton proper, just in some of the nicer suburbs. And Cincinnati is sort of the best of both worlds where it's not as competitive as Columbus. Uh, obviously not as booming as Columbus, but it has better returns in places like Cleveland or, or Dayton because there is still a lot of promise, a lot of jobs. And Amazon just moved their headquarters there a few years ago. So um, yeah, a, a lot of upside, uh, not a lot of downside. And because we're able to have a competitive advantage just because we've been there for a while, it's like we're able to take down some really good deals in a decent market. And so that's sort of the the sweet spot that, that we look for. Awesome, man. Thank you for shedding some light because I've never really dug into it but i was i've always been a little curious about cincinnati mm -hmm. it's just at this point it it is a lot of work for me to i know that it's a lot of work to just jump in and learn all about a new market so i appreciate yeah, the yeah. guidance um okay so <clears throat> do you guys have any like goals set one year five year ten year goals or are you guys just looking to grow is there a broad statement of what you're looking to do moving forward or do you have specific goals uh yeah that's a great question i mean jay and i uh, talk pretty much every day uh, for hours and hours. And a topic that often comes up between the two of us is exactly that, how we look to scale, how we look to grow. Um, and we are, we don't have any specific uh, goals uh, in terms of like a unit count or like, you know, a, a number of deals per year. But we do know that we want to uh, keep scaling in a smart way. So not 
you know, stretching ourselves to a 300 unit as our next deal with uh, just on our own because, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty in the market today too. So we're trying our best to retain most of the equity on deals because we uh, like being operators and, you know, having a capital raising partner is, is great, but we're also trying to ramp up our capital raising so we can, you know, keep most of that equity ourselves. Uh, we have a, a DTS system. We have a full-time VA. Uh, I underwrite. Uh, hopefully we'll get like a construction manager. So Jay doesn't have to be a boots on the ground as, as, as much. So we're, it's a, it's an evolving conversation. Um, we do want to target uh, larger deals in nicer areas of Cincinnati because we typically are have been known for you know those big value add deals for like those 15 units those 25 units but with the shift in interest rates and hopefully prices coming down and um, news of a potential recession it, it could be a great opportunity to start taking down you know only 50 60 70 unit deals in, in nicer areas of Cincinnati so that, that's what we're hoping for but it will depend a lot on how uh, the the new cycle kind of reveals any any changes in the economy. Thanks, uh, Jason. Do you do you guys um have you seen any differences in pricing? Has pricing changed at all? Uh, pricing still remains high, uh, but there's a lot of inventory that's actually gone back onto market. So all of the deals that were locked in back in maybe like August have fallen through and the sellers are still stubborn in that they are still trying to ask for the prices that they were marketing back in April and May and July, but there's a lot less competition because a lot of brokers will call us directly and to see if we're interested, but we're kind of at a point where we have a lot on our plate. So if a deal doesn't pencil at anything less than a home run, we pass on it. So uh, there's actually a lot more inventory, I uh, don't think the prices have caught up, but yeah, we get a lot of calls. So I can only imagine that it's it's a matter of time before sellers uh, start feeling the pain and, and lowering their prices. Right. Even just a little bit, right? <laughs> Come on, guys. Everybody that I asked, they're seeing the same thing in their markets. No no real price differences. And it just is what it is. But I've noticed in, in Florida, less competition from buyers. But exactly. I think- you know, I don't know if that's going to continue or how long that's going to continue, but there were less eyes on things and more brokers willing to call me back. So mm-hmm. don't know. Hey, uh, you mentioned something about talking to Jay every day. And this is just also a personal question that I have because I'm always, always looking for advice and guidance and to see what other people are doing. How do you guys communicate? Is it just text? Or do you have certain, uh, do you use Slack or do you use something that you could recommend us? Uh, we have a standing daily call for on Zoom. Uh, we will talk with one another, see if there's any updates, have our virtual assistant on. Uh, we have a lot of, you know, group calls over Zoom, you know, if we have to talk to a vendor or a lender. And throughout the day, it's just Facebook messages or texts uh, or WhatsApp, since uh, that's what our virtual assistant is on. So, uh, yeah, a variety of ways. Um, but it's mostly actually through calls just because it's easier to, to talk through a short, you know, 10, 15 minute call than type up a dozen messages or so. Yep very it's much more efficient okay awesome and you have your va there you mentioned do you guys uh, you said you have a full-time va how did you find this va uh we used a uh i don't know what to call it like an agency or like a, a broker it, I, th- I think it was someone that uh from mih maybe who gave us a recommendation so i forget what the guy's name is but i gave us a contact the guy helped vet a few vas uh, and then we gave him a little bit of a like a, a signing fee and then yeah crystal is is our full-time a uh, VA that, that works for us for 40 hours a week. How did you train her? Or was she already like knowledgeable on what you needed? Uh, no, she was a little green. Like she was a VA before for, for a few years, but everything related to real estate uh, really comes down to uh, processes. And that's sort of what I uh, lead. Uh, just, you know, recording Loom videos, writing process documentation, walking her through a example of what I want her to do over a Zoom call for multiple times. It's sort of the the traditional way of, of training a VA. But uh, because I have a background in data, I, I, I love processes. I hate doing the same thing a uh, second time. So I always try to automate it. I try to think through how I can make it more efficient so that that helps in, in training a VA or, or keeping her busy. Man, Jason, I love that. And I need that. 
Uh, <laughs> do you have any any guidance on uh, maybe some process systems or processes that you guys use? Any tools or anything? I, I uh, you mentioned Loom. Yeah, honestly, nothing fancy. More of it, I think, is a mindset where you have to just consciously be aware of what you're doing and how it is sucking up time and then logically think through how you can break it down into smaller steps and teach other people how to do those steps. Um, we use Google Drive to share all of our documents. We use Zoom to, to chat and WhatsApp to chat. We use Loom to record videos. We use like Active Campaign to maintain our list of contacts. Uh, and then we've got a DTS system that's based on, you know, Podio. But other than that, there's nothing that helps with the actual creation of the process. Uh, it's mostly me and Jay just kind of thinking through how we become more efficient and, or what small tasks Crystal, our VA, can do for us without uh, needing a, a huge knowledge of, of real estate. Awesome. Um, yeah, you mentioned DTS, and I want to touch on that too in a minute, but... Um... Do you use any like um, Zapier or anything like that to zap or Zapier to like zap things over? I started using it and I haven't really followed through much with it, but I was using it with like Asana. What I would use is I would have like Google Drive. Anytime I uploaded a folder to Google Drive, it would get zapped over to my Asana as a as a card, a property card, and then I would move it through the processes of, you know. But I just I didn't keep up with it. Do you use anything like that? Uh, I have heard of it. Uh, Hadar usually has great recommendations. Uh, we, we usually get so caught up in the day to day where uh, we we have a lot of room for efficiency. So I wouldn't say we use anything uh, that's too revolutionary just yet. We're actually always looking to kind of improve our own processes too. Cool, cool. You mentioned TTS. Uh, are you doing texting, calling, uh, mailers? Uh, texting, calling, and ringless voicemail drops is sort of our, our focus. Mailers, uh, I have heard mixed feedback from that some people will swear by them, even in multifamily. Other people think it's kind of like a waste of money because it's really hard to find the true owners. So uh, we, yeah, we, we don't really focus on mailers. Uh, we do try to do everything else. But we're actually in the process of revamping our DTS too, trying to make it more sophisticated, trying to see if there's uh, a a partner that we can bring on that's willing to to manage the calls instead of because right now our virtual assistant does it but you know her experience in, in real estate investing is, is almost non-existent so trying to see if someone you know who was born in the united states that has is a real estate investor can potentially help us so that's uh also like an evolving conversation but we we are looking to invest some more money and more time into making the dts stronger Cool, 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 cool. Yeah, and I, I found the majority, of, well, all the deals that I've come across have come through a broker. Not all, most. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the, those broker relations are came and they're doing the DTS, right? They're they're yeah, making yeah. those hundred plus calls a day and and building those relationships. So they're really the ones that you know we have to do it all. I guess we have to do DTS as well as foster those relationships with brokers. I agree. Uh, I think a lot of people think that DTS is like a magic pill that all of a sudden increases your deal flow drastically. But we've been doing DTS for the better part of a year and it's got mixed results. We get a lot of our deals through brokers and multifamily is such a small pool. Even in Cincinnati, there's only, you know, a few hundred people that own apartments. And if you're doing DTS and your neighbor's doing DTS and, and all the brokers are doing DTS, like you're, you're reaching the same exact people. It's more mm -hmm. so uh, yeah, trying to make sure our, our funnel is as big as possible. But yeah, I, I always, I, I prefer using brokers as a first line of defense and then DTS kind of as like a cherry on top. Cool, man. Perfect. Okay. Jason, I really brought you on here to talk a little bit about your program. I know that you're deep into underwriting. You do a great job with it and you began kind of like coaching people and creating a course. Let's talk a little bit about what you're working on. Uh, yeah, so education is uh, actually one of our, you know, small goals for 2023. We are still operators and investors first and foremost, but any time that we have left over, um, we're looking to expand our network of sort of uh, newbie investors. A lot of people do reach out to us and historically we really haven't been able to do much or, or help in any way because, you know, we're, we're busy ourselves, but it came to a point where I figured we should start investing the time today to try and create educational content, create you know online courses or boot camps so that all these people that do reach out have an avenue of potentially 
you know, getting to know us or engaging with us. And we're starting that with a an underwriting course, which I'm leading because I, I am the the active underwriter uh, for for us. So uh, our first uh, well, our our first official uh, launch of the boot camp came in uh, December, actually. So just a few days ago, we had a, an alpha cohort and a beta cohort um, or earlier in the year, but it's it's up and running. Uh, I will most likely try to keep the the boot camps an ongoing thing, depending on my bandwidth. But I'm also launching a video course that's more self paced, that doesn't require um, necessarily my direct time, but it also includes time with me to review real deals after you've taken all the the course and watched all the videos. So, yeah, very exciting. A lot of late nights uh, recording videos and kind of writing scripts, but it's something that I'm passionate about, and I'm hoping that it allows people to kind of learn from our experiences and, and grow their own portfolios. Huge, Jason. So, you know, you are a wonderful underwriter and you have a lot to give people, but you don't have much time because you're so active and you're so busy. So, and this is, you're feeling a huge need for people out there. You know, so many people that I speak with, whether they're active or passive, they don't necessarily understand how to underwrite a deal or analyze a deal or look at a deal or even what to ask, right? So, when you're putting this product out there and you're creating certain videos for people that they can then recycle, go through like a library of things and, and punch in a question and find an answer via a video, this is going to really, really help people out. Um, underwriting is a huge topic for both active and passive investors, right? How do you, if you don't know what you're, you know, whether the deal is good or not, mm -hmm. if you don't know how to analyze it, then you really should not be investing. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I, I think I'm also living proof that you can become a full-time real estate investor through underwriting. That was the the skill set that I leveraged to to find the right partners, find the right deals. And I agree with you. In my opinion, numbers is is really all it takes to understand real estate. And if you don't understand the numbers, you're trusting someone else that their knowledge matches your knowledge, that their risk profile matches your risk tolerance. So I always suggest that even if you don't want to be the underwriter for the rest of your career, you should at least understand how to take a look at a deal for yourself. So if you're investing your own money and you're asking your friends and family members to put their life savings into your deal, like you you should understand how the business plan is mapped out. So you're you're more confident. Um and I've taken a lot of underwriting courses, a lot of video courses. I've gotten one-on-one -on -one coaching. I've gotten, uh, I mean, I'm in joint boot camps and part of multiple masterminds. A lot of people gloss over underwriting. It's kind of like the the easy initial step. And they focus a lot on, you know, plugging numbers into a spreadsheet. But based on my experience as a data professional, I know that uh, analyzing is actually all about the process. So that's sort of what I teach. I, I teach people if you are opening up an Excel as your first step and taking a look at a deal that you're actually wasting a lot of time, you should be driving around on Google Maps. You should be taking a look at Bureau of Labor Statistics first to see if that's a market that you want to invest in. So uh, all about like packaging a, a a system to underwrite more so than, you know, just focusing on a, a random spreadsheet to, to plug numbers into cells. I love it, man. It is. It's an art form, right? It's um, mm -hmm. and what I do, like I, I have like, and I, I tried to make, I, <laughs> this is a couple of years ago. So, okay, let me backtrack even more. So when I first met Mikey T, Mike Tarvella was my, mm -hmm. uh, my coach for the, uh, Jake in the Jake and Gino community. And he, I was one of his first students and, and he was their asset manager and underwriter. And I spent one year, every single Tuesday morning at 7.00 AM getting on a zoom with him and underwriting deals. And we, we talked together, we, we looked at stuff together and <clears throat> We grew together. And then I began to build systems of analyzing deals like you're talking about. As opposed, mm -hmm. aside from just having that spreadsheet, which I do have, I created like this link and I went to Fiverr and I find some, I found somebody to create something for me where I just click one button essentially. And then all these links pop up for all those things that you're talking about. Right. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's like when I'm sitting down to underwrite, I click on this thing, boom, all these things pop up and I'm getting ready to just start some preliminary research and and mm -hmm. studying before I jump into those numbers. And then, and I truly enjoy it. And whether people out there enjoy underwriting or not, it's something that's necessary at even a basic level to understand. So providing them 
like you're doing with some sort of coursework or some sort of videos and, and educational pieces paramount. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, my my desire to teach also stems from my, my skepticism. Like I, I always think that the only person that you can truly trust is yourself. So that's why I always promote people to at least understand how, how underwriting functions just so that you know that you're making a, a sound business decision. Cool, Jason. What, um, so is it, is it out yet or is it going to come out in January? Uh, it will launch in January. Uh, the bootcamp is live that uh, is on the Maven platform. Uh, but it depends on if I want to continue or how frequently I want to continue the, the bootcamp just because it, yeah, it takes a lot of time. Mm -hmm. I understand that. And so how can people get like, uh, some information on it or how can people find it? Like, where will it be? Uh, yeah. Easiest way is to probably just follow me across social platforms, Facebook and LinkedIn are where I am most evident. Uh, last name is B A I K. I should be one of the first ones to pop up. And I always post underwriting tips. I, I post when the next bootcamp is going to launch and I, you know, give announcements on how the, the course is progressing. So that, that will probably be the best way to, to stay in touch. Um, and also uh, compoundedcapitalgroup.com. We also have a newsletter and I, I send updates there as well. Awesome. So uh, if people go to your website, they can sign up for the newsletter. You said compounding or compounded capital? Uh, compounding, yes, C-O-M-P-O-U-N-D-I-N-G, uh, capital C-A-P-I-T-A-L group, G-R-O-U-P. It's, it's a long name, <laughs> compoundingcapitalgroup.com. <laughs> no, perfect. Compounding, compoundingcapitalgroup.com. I love mm -hmm. it. All right. Let's transition to our final question, Jason. Let's, okay. ima let's imagine it was 100 years from now. You have great grandchildren. They're so happy. They all know how to underwrite and analyze deals. And they <laughs> want to write a book about you and your life. What would you want them to title this book? That's a really thought-provoking question. I think I would want the title of my book to be something like Jason Bake was authentic and, and genuine. I, I'm a big believer in just working with people that are not blunt because that could come off as, as being an asshole, but just straightforward. And I spent enough years in corporate America to get tired of all the sales and the marketing that a lot of people do. And I know it's necessary for, for business. I, I do sales and marketing myself, but at the end of the day, I try to be as genuine genuinely me as i can be every single day uh, when people ask me what i like I, I tell them what i like what i don't like uh, i'm not a big bugattis or you know yachts type of guy i couldn't care less about material things i kind of just like hanging out with friends and family and having a good time so yeah ho hopefully uh, once i am successful i'll i'll continue to to live by that motto but we'll, we'll see if the the arrogance gets to me no way, Jason. You're not that kind of guy, man. You are <laughs> successful, man. Well, I truly appreciate your time today. And I'm ex really excited that I got you on. As soon as I heard that you had this uh, program coming out for underwriting, I wanted to get you on the podcast right away. Honestly and genuinely appreciate you and everything that you do for our community. Uh, so thank you for joining me today. No, th thank you. Appreciate you having me on the on the call, Nico. All right. Hey, Small Axe community. I would like to say thank you for listening to another episode of my podcast, where we show you how to use your small axe to build a lasting empire. Now, if you liked what you heard, it would mean the world to me if you would subscribe, leave a five-star rating, and write a review. Also, if you want to get in touch with me, go to my website at smallaxecommunities.com. Book a call with me. And until the next episode, keep sharpening those axes.